Uh, my name is Nick Smith. I'm the provost at QUT who acknowledge the First Nation owners and the first scientists of the land in which we now stand. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome everybody to Space Race 2.0. This is a topic which has inspired generations, that capacity to develop cutting edge technology, to go new places, to see new things, and understand the environment and the world that we live on from a completely different perspective, I think is incredibly compelling. Uh, to take us through that, our moderator is an energy expert, uh, a scientific communicator extraordinaire, uh, and a self-confessed food nerd, uh, Dr. Joel Gilmore. I'm Joel Gilmore, and it's my great pleasure to be moderating today's discussion on space. Because right now, there are seven people not on this planet, seven astronauts orbiting the Earth aboard the International Space Station, conducting literally out of this world scientific research into microgravity and more. But how did we get to this amazing stage where humans orbiting our planet is almost no big deal? It's over 60 years since the space race sent the first humans into orbit and beyond. And while our interest in space hasn't gone away, that feverish pace of the space race of the 50s and 60s has, at least until recently, certainly slowed. But our session today is titled Space Race 2.0. So why might we now declare a new space race or perhaps even a new space age? There's a few ingredients in the mix. Commercial enterprises such as SpaceX and Origin, uh, Blue Origin are driving down the cost of a launch through innovation and reusable rockets. And they're also contracting their services to the big agencies like NASA, but also to anyone needing an asset in space and more countries are wanting their own space programs. It's a very exciting time. But like any growth story, there are challenges. With a sharp decline in costs has come a sharp increase in the frequency of launches and the number of satellites being put into orbit, competing literally for space. Space has become more accessible, but should there be a limit to what we launch and when? And what does this all mean for the Australian space industry? Just a few of the questions we're going to tackle in today's session. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance. I'm fortunate enough to be involved in a mission that is probably the best chance in my lifetime of addressing the question of whether life evolved beyond Earth. My name's David Flannery. I'm a geologist based here at QUT in, in Queensland and at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And I study really old rocks on Earth and also on Mars. So the main goals of the Perseverance rover are to look for signs of life, past lives, fossils in a habitable environment on Mars and to cache samples that we'll one day bring back to Earth. And so as a long-term planner for that uh, rover mission, I help guide the science team to a consensus in terms of where we go and, and which rocks we might decide to bring back. There are definitely highs and lows. One of the lows was getting up this morning at about 3 a.m. to dial into operations. But I think I'm really lucky actually to be involved in a, a global science team. And so I'm here in Australia Australia, but sometimes the, the timing of the Earth-Mars links and operations cadence means that I'm one of the only people up in this time zone. And so I get the rover almost to myself and I can work with my colleagues in, in Germany and the UK, you know, just as if I was there in person at NASA JPL. There is a lot of suspense if you spend a decade working on a project and then you strap it to a, a giant explosion and, and send it into space. Um, it has to also make it through, in the case of the Perseverance rover, the Martian atmosphere and land successfully. And yeah, of course, that is uh, absolutely nerve wracking and, and things can go wrong, but that's, that's part of the fun. And there are some really exciting things happening in space exploration right now. We've obviously got Mars rovers and some new uh, missions to the moon happening, but other already selected for funding missions include a mission to investigate the atmosphere of Venus, a mission to an icy moon in the outer solar system, uh, Europa, which could have been or could still be a habitable environment below the ice. 
another mission uh, that involves a giant UAV, nuclear powered, which will investigate the liquid hydrocarbon lakes of Titan. So there's a lot going on. They're just the missions that have been recently selected. So with any mission, you need a very large and diverse group of people. They're obviously the scientists who drive the mission, the goals and the requirements of the hardware. Then there are many different engineers of different flavors that work with the scientists to build the hardware to make that happen. And we also need uh, software developers, uh, people managers, people who do risk assessments, and a huge number of people who are involved in various ways. It's obviously really exciting to be involved in a space mission and have some hardware that you built fly to another planet and generate interesting scientific data. But the most satisfying aspect of the process, I think, is working with a very large team of very clever and kind people and achieving something you really couldn't do on your own. I think these large space science projects are just that. Some amazing work from David. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands, the many lands that we're meeting today and pay my respects to elders both past and present. And now I'd like to introduce our fantastic panel who are here both in person and online today. First up is an expert on commercialization who has worked in senior positions across space, mining, science and technology. Please welcome Ali Buchberger. And Ali is here thanks to our academic partner, QUT. On the screen is an expert on space weather who currently works for the newly formed Australian Space Agency on situational, space situational awareness. Please welcome Liz Pierce. Next up and here in person is an internationally recognised space archaeologist. She's also an author and has an asteroid named after her. It's Dr Space Junk herself, Alice Gorman. And last but by no means least is an award-winning educator and an expert in robotics whose interest has recently turned to space. Please welcome Peter Cork. Also here thanks to QT, our academic partner. So, um, we're going to want to get started by maybe just a little bit of a big picture here, because, you know, if you go back, space was really dominated by the, the big government owned space agencies. We're talking NASA, whose budget is twice that of the next biggest China and three times that of the European Space Agency. But we've now started to see these commercial private enterprises really playing a big role. And maybe, Alice, if I go to you first, um, would you describe this as a, a disruption, the same way that Uber has disrupted the, the taxi industry? What's the sort of state of play? It kind of is a disruption if you think of that kind of radical change of direction. And disruption, of course, it's, it's a word beloved of the new space industries. But, but really, like um, in the last decade, we've, we've had the growth of CubeSats, which made space much more accessible to people, brought the cost of launching a satellite down uh, and sort of spurred this growth of, of space startup companies and all of these possibilities. Then somewhere maybe about, I don't know, like three or four years ago, suddenly everybody is wanting to go back to the moon. And this, I suppose this, this is, was sort of a, a disruptive turning point because it's been the spur for a whole lot of different um, nations who aren't, haven't traditionally been part of the whole space industry or haven't had very active space agencies. Um, and uh, a growth of, of people trying to develop technologies that will help us take that next step. And of course, uh, we're now in this um, era of commercial and privatised space and that's perhaps most evident by the growth of the mega constellations such as SpaceX's Starlink and there's several others in the works as well and this has made uh, like the impacts on our night sky the visibility of these mega constellations is definitely a, a disruptive factor like we can see it when we look up in the night sky and to me part of this is about technology part of it is about national prestige and some of it is about a, a culture change. Like now we're in a situation where nobody wants to be left out of this. So it's not, it's not just about profits. It's not just about technology. It's, it's about a reorientation towards space. And I think that's been the really disruptive element here. Now, Ali, maybe if I could 
build on that commercialization aspect you know is this going to filter down to mm -hmm. australia you know obviously we hear a lot about spacex yeah but is australia going to be getting a slice of this private action and oh definitely um i i think it's right time right place for our <clears throat> very nascent space industry um, and i completely agree with you alice you know space 2.0 is very much around um, you know, a commercial space race. Um, Joel, you mentioned, you know, SpaceX and um, Blue Origin before, um, you know, the, the NASA Space Shuttle, um, which kind of the program finished 2011. Um, but those space shuttles cost around $1.5 billion to launch. Today, you can launch a SpaceX rocket for 62 mil. Um, if you wanted a payload on one of those rockets on the space shuttle back in, you know, the 1990s, um, 22,000 kilograms would have cost about $54,000. Today, that same payload would cost about 2000. So we've gone down by a factor of around 20. Um, and so those commercial space logistics are now moving further into deep space. You know, we've got a commercial lander program. NASA's got a commercial lander program now. Um, and that will then extend um, to mobility across the, the lunar surface as, as Artemis um, kinds of, kind of kicks off. So. Um, yeah, private companies are, are all doing this. You know, governments can't, you know, it's super duper expensive to get to space, right? Um, so governments can't do it alone. And uh, so I think it's a great moment for Australia um, because we're, as a nation, we're incredibly innovative um, as we have sort of greater um, space policy and um, budgetary certainty. Um, there are, um, you know, there's greater certainty for our investment community. We'll, we'll begin to see... Um, increases in capital flows to, to our own space industry. We've got some of the best universities um, in the world producing some of the best and brightest people. Um, and we've got incredible, um, you know, terrestrial heritage in things like field robotics, um, automation um, and remote operations, which positions us really well to do things like lunar rovers. So. I know I've got a seven year old daughter and I hope when she graduates from university, she's going to, you know, I'm going to get the phone call and it's going to be, mum, I'm not going to Silicon Valley. I'm staying right here. I'm going to work for Boeing, not in defence, in civil space. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm going to be like building the next generation moon buggy. Um, you know, I'm going to build, you know, space rated shielding for satellites for Totomic or, you know, work for Ray Tracer here in Brisbane. So I think if you're interested in space, it's a super exciting time. Do you think that does that shift where that now getting to space sort of becomes almost commoditized? You know, that's something the that private industry does really well. Yep. And the role for like you mentioned universities, mm -hmm. does that sort of shift more back to that cutting edge research? Is that? I think they're always collaborations. And I think rather than talking about this being a competitive space race, it's not, you know, the, you know, 70s, it's not, um, you know, it's not a competition between nation states and nor is it a competition between companies because it is so hard. It's, it's such a challenging environment and it's so expensive to get there. Um, it can only be done through commercial and, and industry university partnerships. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, mm. uh, so these massive cost reductions that we've seen, yep. what's driving that? I mean, I know that SpaceX has their reusable rockets where we can see them landing on platforms. Absolutely. Which is amazing. You want to talk a little bit more about what's driving these reductions? I think in SpaceX's case, I think it's they started from the get go to build a rocket to a price point. And that never happened before because it was always a government letting a contract to traditional rusted on defense contractors. And traditionally, price was really no object. It wasn't a consideration. And, and SpaceX kind of broke that model by saying, OK, we're going to try and drive the price down. The reusability, which wasn't there from the start, but it came along relative, you know, uh, I remember now, five years ago, I think they, they started to reliably be able to land. And that was a huge cost takeout. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the fact that, as Ali said, you can go to their website, you can get the price for, for a launch. Mm -hmm. uh, you can download the user manual for a Falcon 9 rocket. It's a pretty <laughs> interesting read. You can't do that for any other kind of rocket on the planet. So I think there's that. At the same time as... Elon Musk was doing SpaceX, he was also doing Tesla. And, you know, Tesla made a very small number of cars initially and then scaled up painfully to be able to mass produce electric, electric vehicles. And there's definite crossover between those two activities. So trying to scale up and mass produce cars 
not nearly as complex as a rocket, but there's some, some mindsets, some technologies, some ideas, probably common people involved in that. And computing is the other thing, right? Computers are now so cheap and so powerful that you can do a lot of things in, in software that once upon a time you probably would have had to do with mechanics and aerodynamics and so on. So that's also been a huge cost takeout. So is this something that perhaps this sort of innovation, this pace of change couldn't have happened, you know, if you went back 20 years, it's because we're sort of in the right time for having computers and technology? Yeah, I think the technology has crossed a threshold at which, you know, the, the amount of computational power you can get in the size and the weight that, are, that it takes up is now useful for these kind of tasks where once upon a time we were not over that threshold. Uh, Alice mentioned CubeSats, I don't know, they're, they're little things like this, right? Uh, and once upon a time, just the electronics that you need and computers you need in the satellite were this big, right? And it just wouldn't fit. But as, again, this inexorable advance in computing technology, uh, you now you've got sufficient computing, you can put in a little box, you get the box in space, you can do awesome things. But you know, Peter, something I think, all of those things are happening, but the one thing we haven't really changed is the nature of the rockets that we're sending up. We have no new propulsion methods mm -hmm. uh, that are going to make it cheaper and easier to manoeuvre in orbit. And I know lots of people are working on um, new propulsion methods, or a lot of them are theories that have been around forever, but nobody's actually operationalised them. We've got mm -hmm. some great work happening in Australia. So. What do you think? Like, do you think we're going to have a breakthrough in actual um, propulsion uh, in the near future? We're seeing in innovation in propulsion. So we're seeing now methane powered, me methane powered engines and they're building them in great quantities for Starship. Uh, and, you know, the, the combustion cycle is something we haven't seen before. But no, on orbit, I don't think there's been any, mm. any change, at, change, at, change at all. Uh, it's either flywheels or iron thrusters. I'm not sure what's coming down the pike there. Well, let's talk Australia, if we're going to talk innovation. Because, Liz, you're with the relatively newly formed Australian Space Agency. And, you know, of course, Australia's been involved in, uh, in, in a space travel for a long time. We've all seen The Dish, right? Um, that's the best Aussie space movie. <laughs> um, but... We've only had, what, two rocket launches from Australia so far, both from Woomera in 67 and 71. So what is Australia looking to, to get from having their own space agency and what can we offer the world? You know, what's your, what's your vision? I'd say we have more to offer than just launch. Uh, launch is a really exciting thing that's coming and uh, there, there was an announcement uh, last week about um, Australia taking launch seriously. We're now going to be funding uh, up to three spaceports in Australia to do launch from Australia and also securing um, ride shares and, and launch services from overseas launch companies in the meantime. Mm. So we're really taking that seriously. But what Australia has to offer is more than that. Um, the Space Agency has seven priority areas that we are really focused on at the moment. And um, as we look at each of those, there's unique abilities within Australia that we have to offer the world uh, in each of those. And without going into specifics, just because we don't have the five hours to go into a, a lot of detail that I would love to share, uh, one of the really key things that the industry has to contribute is that Australia is... Uh, we're, we're hardy people. We're very, very innov in innovative and we're good at doing things in a new way because we have to. We either don't have the people or the resources or the money or, you know, we, we have a, a huge country but a low uh, population density. So we have to be very clever in how we do things and that really shines through in our mining industry and, and the spin out of robotics and um, remote operations, which is going to be really important for um, the Artemis mission and the Trailblazer program that uh, Alice mentioned. It's uh, we have that to contribute across all of our areas and it's really important for Australia to be in the game now. Uh, we rely on space so heavily uh, that it's it's really important that we now stand up and take ownership um, of space for Australia. Yeah, it's an exciting time, although I, I do understand that the Kiwis got a jump on us and have had a, a spaceport for what, about five years now. Um, I'm sure it won't be as great as our, our new ones. Um, <laughs> But Ali, you know, you, 
what's, what do you see as this pathway here? You know, are we going to be are these having uh, acknowledging that launches aren't everything, but is having a spaceport, is that going to help put us on the map, so to speak? Oh, look, I think it will go um, a long way to sort of inspiring the, the Australian um, public. I mean, who doesn't want to see a, lo a rocket launch from Australia? It's, it's an incredibly exciting prospect, right? Um, but I do t tend to agree with, with Liz. A lot of the um, sort of jo jobs and economic growth opportunities are going to happen in up and downstream, um, you know, areas and things like, um, you know, space-based communications, earth observation, um, robotics and automation. Um, and I think whilst there's a lot of attention on, um, you know, the infrastructure to support the, the launch sector, there's also a whole lot of, um, you know, incredibly exciting infrastructure um, to support in those other um, areas as well. You know, one of the examples is the, the lunar test bed that QT is building, um, which hopefully we break ground on this month. Um, a year from now, uh, Brisbane folk will be able to um, take a picnic and, um, you know, go and watch um, QT and, you know, all of our partners um, playing with rovers in this this incredible facility, um, which is, I think, about 20 metres by 10, um, has an area for drilling, a gravity offset mechanism. Um, yeah. And I think also um, is a great example of how this um, investment that's going into space infrastructure can help support um, growth in other key industries as well. So, you know, if a rover can survive in these conditions. It can survive on a mine site. It can survive, you know, in a desert. Mm. Um, so it supports our resources and defence industries as well. Because there's a lot of technology that came out of the original space race has proved invaluable in lots Correct. of other sectors. Oh, 100%. When I'm trying to get my small children to school, like by nine o'clock, I th thank my lucky stars that, you know, NASA invented Velcro. <laughs> Um, well, look, speaking of then technology, let's go you know, Velcro the technology. Um, let's talk more about robotics, mm -hmm. which has obviously been a key part of space travel to date. Could you maybe just give us a little bit of background on the role of robots in space? And sure. I mean, the first things that we put into space were, I mean, just I mean, the first Sputnik was just a radio transmitter that went around and around the planet. But then we started uh, exploring planetary bodies, moon and planet, quite early, uh, well before we poured people into those environments. So this is a picture of Luna 2, which was a Russian probe that crash landed on the moon, I think in 1959. Uh, it's a long time, it's 10 years before we walked on the moon. Uh, the next one is uh, the Surveyor. So this is Surveyor 3, uh, that landed on the moon in 1967, and that is an Apollo 12 astronaut. You would know and who. <laughs> <laughs> that's, um, that's Alan Bean, and I'm particularly fond of both those missions, Surveyor yep. 3 and Apollo 12. It's a wonderful picture, this one. Because this was the first archaeology on the moon. Mm. They actually removed some parts of Surveyor 3 to take back to Earth for analysis yeah. um, in exactly the same way that, that I would do if I was excavating a site on Earth and getting <laughs> artefacts out of it. So it's Fantastic mission. Yeah, so this, this robot beat the, beat the humans by, by two years. Uh, and the next one is... Okay, this is a, a up close at a comet. Uh, so this is one of the comet sampling missions. I think this was the Philae lander uh, just before it be impacted, but we snatched a little bit of comet uh, and brought it back, or maybe it's still on its way back. The next one is... Uh, a picture of Mars taken from a flying vehicle. So this is the fl first flying vehicle on another planet. Uh, it's the in Ingenuity, and here you see it uh, flying from uh, view through the cameras on the Perseverance rover, which is absolutely staggering technological achievement and opens up amazing new ways to plan missions because for a rover that's on the ground, it's got to confront rocks that maybe are of a scale that can't be seen from orbit, uh, but it needs to deal with those. This thing scouting from a height of a few tens of metres is going to bring back fantastic high resolution images that can be used for mission planning. Uh, I'm not sure if we've got any more. Here's another picture of the, the two uh, Mars rovers, Ingenuity on the left. And I think there's maybe one, one more. Oh, and this is the Webb telescope. It's the thing that probably hasn't got as much press as it should have. This is absolutely staggering. It's probably 20 to 30 years in, in, uh, in design, creation, execution. It's now orbiting Lagrange point on the other side of the moon uh, and adjusting its mirrors. And we should get amazing pictures back from this telescope 
uh, later this year. But I think this has got to be one of humanity's greatest achievements, I think. It's yeah. absolutely amazing. And one of humanity's coldest achievements, because didn't they have to like cool it down to like minus 260 something yep. just to yep. get it to work? That's incredible to me. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of scope for robotics and automation technology to either to, to scout ahead of, of, of human explorers or to do things that perhaps at a lower cost point than we can do with human explorers. And also I think to help, uh, robots can help humans that are on places like the space station you mentioned earlier, yeah. Well, our, our little robotic vacuum cleaner does a great job, more or less, <laughs> of getting around the room. Yeah. You know, as long as there's no shake pile carpet on, on the moon, we'll be fine. <laughs> um, so, you know, we're talking here, obviously we've got the technology, we've got the enthusiasm. Um, but I want to sort of throw something for our, for our lawyer friends out there. And, mm -hmm. you know, while I certainly wouldn't advocate sending all the lawyers to space, um, what is the the story with laws in space and maybe uh, maybe Liz I could go to you for this one you know does anyone own space can anyone own the moon short answer no um, it's at the moment you know no one owns space it's a common good for all of us to use however there are um, a series of treaties that um, nations can sign up to through the United Nations so Australia signed up to five it's important for us to be responsible in space um, besides these, you know, if we, if we don't own the space, uh, it's important for us to still be responsible and um, safe in our use of space um, and in our use of the moon as well. Um, we want to make sure that anything we do on the moon is responsible and doesn't damage it in a way that can be irre irreversible. What about an asteroid? If somebody goes out and harnesses an asteroid and wants to drag it back, can they lay claim to that? Oh, that's a, an even more complicated question, um, and I think we're going to be able to answer that when it's possible to do so. So at the moment, it's not quite feasible just yet, but I wouldn't say it's never going to happen um, because resources um, in space are going to be very quickly uh, important as we explore into the galaxy, into the solar system. It's um, the more resources we can gain from in space rather than having to bring them from Earth, the better off we'll be, the better the business case for us to be able to explore. Um, because the more you bring, the heavier it is, the higher the cost. So if you can get your resources in space, then you're saving yourself a lot of money and effort. Um, but yeah, I think we're gonna have to wait and see what happens and how, we, how we're gonna handle that because there's nothing set yet. And laws, and, laws and regulations always playing catch up with technology, right? Uh... I guess we, we talk about disruption, yeah. Uber changing, forcing changes to the taxi yeah. laws and everything. Yeah. Um, actually, we've got a question. We are taking questions um, through the chat function here. So if you have questions, throw them in the chat and we'll try and get through as many as we can. We've got a question from Jasmine, uh, which I think ties into some of this. Is there a race between countries to develop a moon base? And if so, are there global regulations when it comes to that commercialisation and development? So I guess, you know, in Antarctica, we sort of have slices of countries, but could, do you, could you imagine that we might own, you know, Australia might own a moon base in the future as sovereign land? Ali, I see you're sort of... Oh, um, again, I, I think I come back to the point that it's just so incredibly difficult and expensive to get there um, and it won't happen unless it's a collaborative rather the, than a competitive effort. And, and that's what Artemis is. It's, it's a global collaborative effort. Um, you know, Australia's, um, you know, signed on to, to, to the effort um, with an initial $150 million commitment. Um, and I think agencies, and maybe this is more sort of Liz's area, but um, really work very closely to, together to ensure it stays that way. And we're not rushing, by the way. Like, deep space is always a long-term um, game, which is a bit of a challenge for um, sort of venture-backed companies. Um, but yeah, a lot of planning required. Yeah. But we're talking, the people are talking now about commercially operated space station as yep. the next one, yep. the next one up there uh, from Blue Origin and others. Yep. So maybe the next frontier after that is to have a commercially operated moon base or, or Mars base, but yeah. uh, it would be expensive and I don't know what the value proposition yeah, yeah. So the Blue Origin, you know, um, commercial space station is a, is a huge collaboration between, mm. I think, Arizona University is part of it, Boeing, others. Um, yeah. Lunar but it only Gateway makes sense again. if they can get tenants, right? 
Yeah, hundred percent. Lunar Gateway again, you know, a huge collaborative effort. But I think there's another critical element of this this international cooperation as well, which is the concept of interoperability. Mm. So the idea that in order to, to minimise environmental impacts by sharing infrastructure and to facilitate that collaboration and cooperation, that systems are going to be designed uh, to be sort of interchangeable or like everybody can use common structures and standards, um, which, which of course will increase safety as well. Like if you have a complete disaster, if your moon base blows up, um, you'll still be able to hook your systems into someone else's. And I think that's going to be, there's lots of organisations, Liz would know more about this than me, lots of organisations discussing this at an international level. Uh, and I think this is, is one of the things which means it, it can't be, it can't all be about competition. Like people are going to have to share stuff to survive and to make it work and to make those profits mm -hmm. they want to make. And so I think interoperability um, is becoming a bigger and bigger issue in the way that um, all those agencies and corporations are kind of looking to collaborate. You're absolutely right. Um, if we're going to do this and we're going to get, take space exploration seriously, go to Mars, uh, go to asteroids, all of that, we need to do it together. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not going to be um, pr productive for us to compete on a national scale. I think we need to work together. So the agency talks to the other space agencies around the world to see how we can best contribute to things. Um, and with the moon in particular, the, Australia is uh, one of the few signatories to the moon treaty. So we have responsibilities to make sure that whatever we do on the moon is responsible. Um, and that's a big belief in the agency is to, is to be responsible in, in our exploration of space, not be um, flippant in how we do things. And it's a, it's a interoperability is one of the really key pieces of that. Um, so that, you know, if, if, if say NASA put a base on the moon, just just for example, um, and Australia has rovers um, that are on the moon working towards um, you know servicing that base or something like that, the the Australian equipment needs to be able to uh, be interoperable with um, the NASA facilities and the the European facilities, uh, all of the um, different nations, space nations that are. are heading towards the moon now, we all need to work together to make it a collaborative effort so that then we can then all move on together towards Mars and to greater space. Well, I'm certainly supportive. I'm in this rare position right now where every laptop and phone in my house charges off the same cable. And I just think it's, it's a great time to be alive. So I'm full of time to get to space. Uh, we have that same level of cooperation. Um, Maybe we'll, we'll, we might come back to the moon and probably some of that further afield stuff in a moment, but also want to talk about some of the perhaps challenges that are accompanying this. We touched on a little bit before about, I think, Alice, you mentioned that we can see satellites in space all over the place now. So how many satellites are actually up in orbit um, at the moment? I think the latest figures are, are 6,000 452 or something like that, <laughs> of which about 3,700 are operating satellites and the rest are not operating for various reasons, not or, or just because they're not functioning, they're not being used, I guess. So that's, that's the sort of latest figures on how much stuff is up there. That's not including what we call space junk or space debris, which is often not whole satellites, it's fragments, um, bits of mission related debris, little tiny particles, all that kind of stuff as well. So that's, those numbers are just the whole spacecraft. And that, that's just getting bigger, like 2021 was a record year for satellite launches? Yes, yeah, something like, I think in the last few months of 2021, 10% um, of the entire decade's launches were carried out. And current predictions are by 2030, there will be 100,000 new satellites in orbit. What, what are all these satellites doing? The, the biggest growth in numbers is actually low Earth orbit based telecommunications. Mm. So there's, there's a whole range of stuff satellites do, which include um, navigation every time you fire up your smartphone to find your way to that restaurant you said you'd meet your friends with in the street but don't quite know how to get to and you hook into a navigation system that's pulling down satellite data so navigation is a huge one. Um, Earth observation that gives us things like um, uh, monitoring terrestrial weather, space weather, um, disaster management, um, environmental data, um, maps, all kinds of stuff. 
Um, we have a lot of military surveillance satellites up there as well. So defence is a huge function for all of these things. Um, the, the big surprise, I guess, um, it'd be interesting to see what the others think about this. So for a long time, our telecommunication satellites were concentrated in geostationary orbit. That's about 35,000 kilometres above the Earth. And if people are looking at the picture, it's the big broad ring about the Earth. So that used to be where all the telecom satellites were. The mega constellations have brought that function back to low Earth orbit within about 1,000 kilometres of the surface of the Earth. Uh, so, and this is the most dense area, the highest traffic, the highest amount of junk. Um, so we're radically increasing the number of satellites and the amount of junk in that close to all Earth region, which is, I don't think where we expected we were going to be in this decade. Which I guess brings us to the big question is, is there a limit? Is there too much, too much? Peter, do you have any... What's... I think there has to be there has to be a, a limit. I know when Elon Musk has been quizzed about this, he just says space is really big. There's plenty of room. But I mean, human beings have uh, got a terrible reputation of just saying, you know, this river's really big. It can absorb all this sewage until it can't. Or you know, we can chop, exploit all this land you know, until we and, and until we destroy its functionality. So no, I don't think humans have got a very good track record at this with this at all. And this is a problem that we can see coming. Yeah. We see climate mm. change coming too, and we haven't done much about that. Yeah. So, no, we <laughs> yep. And we'll feel the effects of it, you know, decades from from mm. now. You know, just just last week, a, a well, we think Chinese-made rocket, um, you know, crashed in into the moon, leaving mm. a t and was it was built a decade ago, right? Um, and left a twenty by ten meter crater, as in you can fit two or three semi trailers in this crater. Mm. So it's extending beyond space now to the lunar surface. Mm. So how do, we, how do we try and resolve this? I mean, um, Liz, you mentioned before the importance of cooperation, everybody working together. You know, is this a problem that we can solve? Like, can we coordinate and you know, share resources rather than everyone having their own copy? Or are nations going to want to still have their own thing? I think it's going to be a bit of both. Um, there's definitely conversations going on at the United Nations. That's where all the countries come together to try and agree on um, laws and regulations and, and common best common practice for us all to abide by. But, you know, those conversations tend to take a while because getting getting agreement across that many people on, on that scale is, is quite important. Uh, and they need to understand the impacts of what they're agreeing to for their own um, country's survival or future. So in the meantime, it's important for each nation to do their best to be safe and responsible in space. You know, the, this space debris problem is is extremely dangerous. Um, and as Peter said, we can see it coming. We know that there's, there's um, a really bad situation coming right at us and a lot of people know about it. And we're working very, very hard to figure out how to get away from that and how to solve it, you know, debris removal, debris mitigation, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, the the it's, again, the similar idea we're talking with the moon, the technology is probably going to have to beat the regulation um, or the laws so we all need to do our own part to make sure that we ourselves are responsible in how we how we operate um, while the the global unification is is ongoing. I think there's a couple of other interesting issues in this as well, which which are that um, there's been guidelines around for a couple of decades on how to design new space missions to minimise the amount of debris created. Yeah. However. Somewhere between 60 and 40 percent of all new missions launched do not follow them. So that's the thing we can do. And that's the thing Australia, you know, is very conscious of and working on as well. That leaves us the problem of what to do with the stuff that's already up there that we can do nothing about. So that's where active debris removal becomes the key problem and where we need the technology. But even if, if 100 percent of all missions launched followed the guidelines to minimise the creation of debris, we'd be in a very different position um, now than, than we are, I think. And so, I don't know, it's, it's mystifying to me why, why it is so hard to do something simple like tether a lens cap to the camera instead of having it fly off as a separate piece of debris. Like, you wouldn't think that would be so hard. 
How do you then encourage people down the track? I mean, is it, you know, can governments through funding agreements incentivize this sort of behaviour? Is it, you know, that we need to start putting pressure on the, the big entrepreneurs? Ali, do you have any thoughts on, or well, Liz, I saw, saw you nodding, nodding then? Oh, yeah, so I'm currently working on the Space Situation Awareness and Debris Monitoring Roadmap for the Space Agency. So this um, is actually coming up quite a lot. And um, there's, there's, we've engaged with the industry um, and the Australian community a lot about how, how do we move forward, how to answer that question that you've just asked. Um, and there's two sides. There's the regulation side, you know, saying that every new payload that Australia launches must adhere to these guidelines that Alice spoke about, um, which you know, on paper sounds great, then everybody's then following those rules and we and we don't have a problem. But the impact on the, the small businesses or the, the universities that are building these things can actually be quite dramatic. Um, and so we have to find a balance between being able to enable our industry to do what they need to do to, to launch their satellites, to launch their technologies, um, but also educate them and, and make people aware of the consequences of the choices they're making in their design. So there's, uh, we're looking at a sort of a phased approach where we start off with awareness, which you know is, is actually really important. Some people just don't know that they need to, to tether a lens cap to, to the camera, It's which as soon as that's being made away, you're like, okay, that makes sense. It's doable. It doesn't add too much weight. It doesn't add, doesn't get in the way of anything. We can do it. Um, but when we're saying they need to add in deorbiting mechanisms so that the satellite, when it when it dies, um, can be deorbited quickly rather than staying up there for decades, which is the problem, which is why the space debris problem is so so bad, is because things just stay up there for so long. Um, you know, we we just need to find the balance between telling people you must do this and giving them the, the ability to do the responsible things in a way that won't crush their business case. So it's it's about growing, making sure that, you know, the, the technology that is needed for deorbiting or, you know, minimising debris is accessible, is um, not too expensive, is, um, yeah, that they can get a hold of it and use it without it just ruining everything. So it's a bit of a balance. At which, Tyson, I've got a question from JR who would like to know, how do we go about cleaning up the space junk? I think a couple of you mentioned that there are technologies on the table. Would anyone be able to talk about what we're talking about here? We're looking at Ali, a few people. No. <laughs> Alice? Yeah. Well, um, one of the leading companies working on this is Astroscale, which um, is based in Japan, and they've actually got a mission up there right now called Elsa D, which is, well, I'm calling it Elsa, I think that's how they pronounce it, um, which is, which is um, testing like a little docking manoeuvre so that in the future um, some kind of space junk removal tug could dock with something and pull it out of orbit. Um, there's al also in the last couple of years there was a successful harpoon test. So Surrey Satellite Systems and um, a couple of other partners, they put a bit of stuff up in space and then they shot a harpoon at it and the harpoon went in and attached. So there you've got, we've got, and it was in space. So part of the, we've, heaps of stuff has been tested on Earth, but very little has been tested actually in space. So that was successful. So, so yeah, like we've got some positive stuff happening. But who um, would pay for it? Well, that's to say the problem is the business case. Yeah. Um, what is the business case for removing space junk? Well, there's a pretty big business case for not ruining space so that nobody can launch anything into it ever again. Yeah. Um, but yes, I suppose that doesn't scale in the right kind of way. Yeah. You've got a huge gyre of plastic waste in the middle of the Pacific. I was going to say, which you is, need a terrestrial application yeah, for that space. Which tech. we uh, can't even deal with that, right? Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. if, we, if we don't fix space junk, then there's going to be real cost to the commercial industry. Like, assuming that space junk can destroy satellites mm -hmm. or... A speck of paint. You've seen gravity, yeah. right? Yeah, oh yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think, again, going back to my Jaunders view of human nature, until there's a crisis, until, say, some important government-owned defence or navigation satellites get taken out by this, I don't think we'll see action. Sorry, Liz. I was just going to say pretty much what you said, Peter, that um, we're going to be forced to, to solve this problem probably sooner rather than later. And it's not just that we're going to, to destroy commercial 
um, entities, if we're going to destroy Australia's way of life if we're not on top of this. Australia is incredibly space dependent mm. on our, for communication, for G, GNSS, um, you know, positioning, Earth observation, everything Alice mentioned earlier. It's um, it's going to be catastrophic if we let this this problem go on too long and don't do anything about it. Um, then we end up with, you know, a syndrome known as Kessler syndrome where it, it becomes uncontrollable and then we can, all our satellites sort of become unusable, destroyed, and we can't leave the planet. Mm. We can't go into space. We can't go to the moon. You know, anything trying to get through that debris cloud will just, you know, hit a wall basically. Mm. So we're going to have to figure this out um, and it'll probably be exactly as Peter said, we're going to be forced into it um, by, a, by a, a dangerous situation that will happen that will just really, really drive home the, the importance. Which I think raises another interesting issue, which is terrestrial backups, because we're kind of abandoning terrestrial infrastructure for space infrastructure, and I think the Starlink and Mega constellations mm. are very much evidence of that. Mm. Um, in some places, the promise of providing um, low-cost internet to remote or otherwise underserviced parts of the world, um, that... that only exists because the terrestrial infrastructure hasn't been developed. Mm. So if we become too reliant on space without being able to step back into that, I often think of libraries, like, like I hope they, that libraries are keeping their old card catalogues because what happens if we can't go to the library and find a book because we, we you know, so dependent on the online catalogue that we can't find it anymore. I mean, there are equivalents for, for um, telecommunications and weather prediction, all that kind of stuff as well. So, and so old, I think a balance... old school radio navigation systems, Loran, yeah. they're all being turned off. Yes, yes. <laughs> but if so... GPS goes down, we've got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there the possibility of malicious attempts to take down mm. other satellites? Mm. Ali, is that something that... Is that like a risk that anybody would, would actually worry about? Well, I mean, the militarisation of space is expressly prohibited by the Outer Space Treaty. But um, I, I think we're also seeing a, a trend towards space sovereignty um, and um, closer links between defence and space. Um, you know, the, the US created its space force in 2019. We've now got the French Space Command, um, Australian government parliamentary inquiry into the space industry, had a number of recommendations, which included, um, you know, taking a more holistic approach from a, a policy and budgetary standpoint to, to defence and space. Um, so I think that's, there's that general trend, but um, I think there are only four countries in the world that have... Um, you know, tested an, um, sort of a, an offensive asset in space, um, you know, US and worryingly China, India and Russia. Um, you know, the, the more common is to jam or interrupt a space communication rather than take out a satellite. Now, I think the risk there is a bit like nuclear war. If yeah. you go and explode someone's yeah. satellite, you create yeah. a pile of debris, uh, which you potentially take out your own satellite. So I think it's a, yeah. they've tested it, but I think it's a risky strategy. Yeah. I think it's also um, one of the reasons why the um, debris um, cleanup process has actually been slowed because those technologies that Alice walked us through could quite easily be turned and faced to an operational satellite of your enemy. And mm. you know, what's to say you don't use that on debris and use it on a on a real satellite? It's yeah. um, it's a it's a big game of trust, really. Mm. Mm. Seems to be a recurring theme of internationally everybody working together for a common good. Um, I still have confidence that we can get there, but as you say, Peter, maybe we'll start with climate change. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we can solve that one. Uh, now, we do have a couple of questions coming from the audience, so we might sort of take just a moment to step back from these heady discussions that would involve the end of all space travel. Um, Shana asks, what are the most exciting innovations or advancements happening now or soon in the industry? No, I mean, maybe what might we be talking about at WSF 2032? Peter, are you excited by anything at the moment? Oh, I've always been excited about all things, all things space. Uh, I, I think it will just, I mean, some of the things that David Flannery mentioned in the introduction, I mean, if we can start to explore Europa and Titan, that would be absolutely amazing. I mean, there are places that seem in many ways quite, perspective for life, perhaps life very different to the way it's evolved on, on this planet. So uh, to me, excitement is going to come from more advanced uh, robotic missions. Yeah, it'd be great to see a 
space, space, uh, a human presence on the moon and on Mars. Yeah. But I mean, interesting, but I'm not sure it, it's really that radical. I think to get further out into into planets, maybe even beyond the solar system, and do some exploring there, that would be fabulous. Mm. Um, Ali, what about, you know, the research that you're involved yeah. in? Do you have sort of like a, what do you see as the big thing over yeah, the horizon? Yeah, so right now I'm happy with the moon. Um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I agree with Peter. I, I don't think those seven people who are, you know, off the planet right now should be off the planet. I think they should be robots. Um, and that's, you know, where we're headed with, you know, the Lunar Gateway being uncrewed 90% of the time. Mm. You know, the robotic workforce we're talking about to, to build this sustainable <clears throat> presence on the moon. Um, I'm excited about Trailblazer, um, which is, um, you know, the Australian Space Agency's um, first moon mission. Australia's going to the moon. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yes, uh, the Space Agency is committed to um, putting an Australian um, made rover on the moon sometime from 2026. Um, a hugely collaborative effort between our um, brilliant scientific community um, and our, um, you know, our, our space businesses um, and businesses from other parts of the, the sector who can spin in technologies um, and assist. So hugely collaborative, um, hugely exciting. Um, the rover will be small, 20 kilograms, um, be delivered to the lunar surface on a commercial lander, egress down the ramp. Um, and then through increasing levels of autonomy, um, basically collect lunar regoliths, so moon dust, and transport that to a, um, a NASA um, facility, which will um, look to extract oxygen from that regolith um, with a view to proving that technology um, for, to establish a sustainable presence. So is that being done on the moon or is it going to send it back to Earth? For... Uh, I think that will be done on the moon. Yeah. yeah. Um, and our and the Australian rover will die on the moon after um, yeah after fourteen. That will be days. our second Australian archaeological site on the moon. <laughs> if you count Brian O'Brien's little dust monitor on Apollo Eleven, yeah. mm -hmm. so I think that would be marvellous to have little Australian rover tracks and the little dead rover in its in its final resting place. Yeah. <laughs> Nevertheless, we hope the mission will inspire the Australian public. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't want dead rovers on the news. <laughs> sorry, sorry <to> <laughs> Um, so yeah, you know, for the way we think about it as a, as an education in institution, it's also about that um, amazing ability to inspire the next generation of our space workforce. About that public outreach, you know, creating digital twins and simulations that can, you know, enable um, you know kids in classrooms on on a tablet to be able to follow this mission um, for you know the museum um, here in Brisbane or um, you know Space Discovery Centre in Adelaide to to have you know large infrastructure displays of, of this incredible mission. So it's exciting. That's why I go to work every day. Absolutely. And um, we've got another question here, which sort of ties into about students and yeah. getting inspired. Anna and KJ want to know about how do we direct our or feed our kids into the space program to get them started? Mm. What do you recommend people start studying? What are the jobs of the future space industry? I think there's going to be a lot of jobs which are going to be engineering jobs, uh, absolutely, to create the technologies to do these things. So they should be studying maths and physics. Uh, that's really important at school. Uh, and then going to university and studying various flavours of, of engineering, electrical engineering, mechatronic engineering, mechanical engineering. They're all pretty important. Uh, computer science is going to be important as well. Uh, a lot of analytics and data to be processed uh, mm. from products in space that are that are gathering data. Uh, Alice, you've probably got a different perspective. I <laughs> do. <laughs> as a non as a as an archaeologist, um, we do need all of those jobs, but we also need expertise and skills from the humanities and social sciences sector, also mm. uh, the medical sector. So, so a huge strength for Australia is aerospace medicine. Mm. We've got some fantastic work going on there. And um, we are going to need, so, so I'm an archaeologist, I work in the space sector as well. Um, I'm currently, I have a project on the International Space Station looking at human adaptation to microgravity with applications to the, to the design of new space habitats. So, so there's a whole career pathway too. And um, there's also, 
we're talking about space 2.0 today, but there's already something that's been identified as space 5.0, and this is ethical space. Mm. So we need space ethicists. So get out there and get a philosophy degree mm. because there are already people employed full time as ethicists in the space sector. So it's not just all about the engineering as important mm. as that is. I would completely agree. Absolutely. I'd say if you want to be in space, the first point of call is curiosity. That will get you most of the way. Um, everybody who works in space, if you speak to them, are excited and curious about growing and learning. Um, so that's a great place to start. Um, everything Peter said is true. Engineering is probably the biggest um one of the biggest, anyway, uh, uh, career paths. I'm a physicist by trade, so I'll be, do the plug for physics, go physics. Um, <laughs> it's better than every other degree. Everyone should be a physicist. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you, know, you know, science in general, um, you know, chemistry, biology, they're all going to be really important as well. Um, but also going along with what Alice said, um, the humanities is is going to be ever increasingly important. If we're going to put people in space for long term, if we're going to have a permanent presence in space, psychology, I think, and medicine are really going to be um, really important. You know, how do people survive? How do, how do people thrive in space? How do they adapt to living so far away from everything they've ever known and loved? Um, so the psychology element is going to be really important. And, yeah, the medicine um is really fascinating. It's not my background, but I get to um, look at it through the space agency. And Australia is actually really good at, um, you know, remote medicine. You know, we've got remote um, remote um, areas in, in Australia. We also have, um, you know, Antarctica and doing remote medicine for Antarctica. Um, so we're actually really good at that. So we've got something to, to do there. So I'd say get into the sciences if, if that's the way you go. But if you're just curious about space, whatever path you take will probably lead you back to space. So we have space anthropologists to understand how people work there. And Dave Flannery, again, from the beginning, is a geologist who got into space, right? So, yeah, as you all said, lots yeah. and lots of pathways in, yeah. driven by passion and enthusiasm. 100%. And I think what that's supported by our tertiary education system and our, our culture around lifelong learning. I think, you know, what we do really well in Australia is upskill and reskill. Um, and so quite aside from, you know, kids wanting to, to get into the field, there's, you know, an opportunity for people from all walks of life um, to step into new careers in our industry. Mm. Even accounting. I will put that out there as well. Even Space business. needs Law accountants and, and business. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the lawyers are big. Um, and, and you mentioned, uh, Liz, you mentioned biology, which, you know, we shouldn't forget about good old Mark Watney on that great <laughs> documentary, The Martian. Mm -hmm. um, exactly where, you know, I'm a bit of a food nerd, so growing food and how we create sustainable worlds there, I think, and tasty food, I mean, happy astronauts. Not just potatoes. Not just <laughs> potatoes. Um, so I understand that the soil on Mars actually would have been toxic. They since discovered after the, after the uh -oh. novel, so, which is terribly disappointing. But, um, and that does bring us, I think, to one of the, sort of the last things I want to talk about, because we are slowly running out of time, which is the, you know, we've talked about being in orbit, we've talked about maybe a moon base going back to the moon. What about Mars? You know, do you think, are we, I mean, obviously Elon Musk is very enthusiastic about getting to Mars this decade. Um, do you think we're going to, we're, we're going to get there? We're going to have a Mars base? Um, Liz or Ali? Who do you mean we? Do you mean we Australia or we the world? Let's go with we the world in the first instance. I think, I think, yeah, I think Mars is going to be um, a great place to go and explore. Um, I think it's going to be important for our understanding of not only life on Earth but life in the universe. Um, if there is possible life on in the universe, it's um, going to be a really key place to sort of expand from. So I think, I think we're going to get there. We may not get there as soon as we'd like. You never know. Um, things are changing every day, but um, I think we'll get there. One day we'll get there. And do you see this as a, we often talk about like, is the moon like the, the launching point that we then go to Mars from the moon? Or is this going to be, are we going to just like get straight to Mars? Like how, do we, how does this happen? How do we get there? I'm uh, not sure the moon is that much closer to, to Mars than, than our planet, unless we want to, and if we did assemble anything to go to Mars, it would probably be done in orbit, not on the, we wouldn't assemble it on the moon. I'm not sure that would make that would make sense. We might use lunar fuel, though. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's uh, 
one of the key things about the moon is is if we if we can get water from the moon, we can turn that into fuel. Mm -hmm. You can get your fuel in space, then it just makes it so much easier to get yeah. get yeah. anywhere. Yeah. And is that that water is that just in the ice caps, or are there pockets, or well, not ice caps, but is ice, yeah. yeah under under the under the soil? Uh, I can't recall off the top of my head. I have a feeling that there may there was a. a, a research expedition to look at um, whether there's ice in um, the duck, like the deep craters yeah. um, where the sun can't touch. Um, that's where ice would form. So, yeah, typically I think that's part of region. any future stuff. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Ali. I was just going to say typically in any shadowed regions, whether it's craters or the permanently shadowed regions. Yeah. And I guess we've got the challenges. Peter talked about sending robots as the, the forerunners mm. for exploration. Landing on Mars is not a trivial task for rovers and the likes. And what's the success rate? Do you ever? I think the success rate on Mars for the United States has been very, very high. I mean, other other countries have, have struggled. The success rate on, on Venus, I think, is appallingly low. Um, I disagree. Yeah. I think Venus is far more fascinating than anyone gives it credit for. Mm. And, um, OK, the early <laughs> Russian missions um, tended to get crushed or destroyed through the atmosphere, but from about Venera 7 on, they had highly successful surface uh, landing okay. missions that returned a lot of data. But maybe that's just my passion for Venus that's okay. <laughs> countering that. <laughs> so... I, yeah, landing landing on Mars is going to be is going to be challenging. But again, if you look at what SpaceX is is trying to do with their with their great big rocket, uh, maybe it will maybe it will work. Uh, it's going to get a bit of an I mean that sort of technology is going to get a bit of an outing for moon landing, right? So they'll they can trial it trial it. Got to have a lot of failures before you succeed. So I think. Mm. Uh, uh, a low success rate isn't going to be a problem in the sense that we just need to learn from those failures and then we'll just smash it. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Well, we had one more audience question, which is also mine, about the future of space tourism. Mm -hmm. And how are we, we've talked about perhaps whether astronauts should indeed be in orbit at the moment, um, but there's certainly a lot of people who are very excited about going on a, a trip into space. Do you see that as a as a growing industry? Is that something that's going to help perhaps fund some of these this research and projects? Alice, you... oh, I'm just I'm just because my current research is is looking at how um, crew members on the International Space Station sort of adapt and use objects in their environment to survive. And one thing we need, no, I'm going to say one thing we need in space is nice things for people to eat and drink as tourists. And uh, one of Australia's advances in this area is the development of the first space qualified beer, which was tested <laughs> at the former uh, QUT drop tower um, just out here. So we've, we've, we've contributed to that part of space tourism. But I'm sorry, toilets in space are still terrible. And if that's something that will make you enjoy your travel to space, like having to grapple with a poorly designed, unpleasant, brutal experience every time you need to take care of that side of your experience, um, <coughs> then great. Otherwise, for a good space tourism industry that's not just hopping up to suborbit and back down, we need better space toilets. So there is a whole career path for a, a range of young Australian engineers, doctors, anthropologists, archaeologists right there. A call to arms, indeed. Would you, would you go into space if you had the opportunity? You know, Elon phones you tomorrow and says, Alice, I want you on my next launch for, you know, a couple of spins around the Earth. Would you go? Well, Elon's never calling me because I've, I kind of said the red Tesla sports car he launched in 2018 was a metaphor for a part of the male anatomy. So he's never getting on the phone to me. But <laughs> if that did happen, I'm, I'm not sure because, because another thing that happens is space sickness. Um, it's not pleasant either. Um, you have to be up there for a few days to adapt to it. So I, I don't know. I mean... How could you say no? But I think there's all these things when people talk about space tourism, they forget to mention, and space sickness is one of them. So I don't want to vomit the whole time I'm up there. I really don't. <laughs> Would any of you go? Would any... I love the idea of space exploration, but I'm doing it from here. Mm -hmm. Liz is, like, comfortably directing the mission. Yeah. That's, uh, I'll, I'll um, definitely help from, from the ground. I'm scared of heights. I just... <laughs> someone else can... 
<laughs> Ito, any appetite? I'm not sure. Once upon a time, it would have been absolute no brainer. Yes. Uh, now I'm not. I'm not so sure. Uh, well, look, Elon. If you want my number, just <laughs> I'm happy to. Uh... Um, well, look, I, I think that has been a fantastic discussion where we've covered pretty much the full breadth of everything from the, the future legal challenges um, through to the practicalities of actually getting in, of actually being in space and all of the mundane human aspects. And then, of course, everything in between the space junk challenge, the robots that are going to pave the way, whether we have crewed missions or not. And, of course, the exciting future for Australian researchers, students Absolutely. and the entire space industry here. So I think it's a it's a really exciting time to um, to be talking about space and a perfect, perfect talk for the World Science Festival right here in Brisbane. And I really hope that we can have you all back in another couple of years to hear about the latest advancements and um, the breakthroughs that we've Australia contributed. So I think at that point, we are going to wrap up the session. So thank you very much to all of our panels and thank you everybody for dialing in for your fantastic questions. Sorry that we didn't get to all of them, but I hope a lot of these folks are on Twitter. And of course, there are some great discussions to be had over the coming weeks and months and years. So make sure you're part of that. But for now, please join me in thanking our fantastic panel today, Ali, Liz, Alice and Peter. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, we'll see you at another World Science Festival event very soon. Have a great day. Thank you.